Welcome everybody. Thanks so much for coming tonight, being here in person and on Zoom. I'm Julia at the library and I'm excited for another awesome wildlife program in the Wild Maine series in partnership with the Center for Wildlife Studies. Everybody on Zoom, you can type your questions into the chat or Q&A and I'll read them out loud at the end. Everybody in person, you can ask questions normally. <laughs> Um, now, uh, I'll hand it over to Jack Hopkins of the Center for Wildlife Studies to introduce our speaker, Jared Woods. Thank you, Julia, and thanks for everybody for being here, uh, both in person at the Canada Public Library and virtually out there in the world. Um, before I introduce Derek, uh, first things first, if, if you could silence your phones, um, we're going to try to keep questions to the end, if possible. Um, if there's somebody who really has a question they have to ask, then, you know, please go ahead. We got lots of kids in the audience and that's super awesome. Um, I just want to say a couple words about CWS. Many of us don't know the, who, who the heck we are. We're the Center for Wildlife Studies. Um, we're a Maine-based nonprofit. We're devoted to providing accessible environmental education to people all over the world. And we promote wildlife conservation through science. So we provide specialized training to people around the world and topics related to ecology, conservation, resource management environmental science. We also conduct research around the globe to expand our knowledge and also to, to inform conservation and management efforts. Um, today, we're continuing our community education partnership with the Camden Public Library called Wild Maine. Uh, the purpose of this program is to educate our community and our visitors about the amazing natural resources that we have here in this great state. Um, Following the talk, please consider uh, supporting our mission by donating to, to Wild Maine program um, at CETA, uh, centerforwildlifestudies.org. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank our primary sponsor, Whipfly, for uh, supporting us as a, as a sponsor. Uh, now on to Derek Yorks. Derek. Derek's a wildlife resource biologist with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. He serves as the department lead uh, biologist on reptile and amphibian issues, where he coordinates research and conservation efforts on several priority species here in the state. He graduated with a BA in ecology at Hampshire College, Hampshire College, and a master's in wildlife and fisheries conservation at UMass Amherst. Derek's currently focused on assessing the distribution status and management needs of blandings, spotted, and wood turtles, as well as black, as, as well as black racers in Maine. And he's also guiding mitigation recommendations for impacts of roadways on Maine's herps. I've also had the privilege to work with Derek recently uh, for the past few years on developing wildlife forensic methods uh, to combat the illegal turtle trade here in Maine and elsewhere. Recently and interestingly, Derek, Derek has also co-founded Wild Vision Systems, a company that's combined herp trapping with AI technology to aid in invasive species removals. Today, Derek will introduce many of us to the snakes of Maine. Welcome, Derek. Hey, thanks everybody. Um, thanks for the great intro, Jack, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks for braving the dark and stormy night out there to come uh, learn about snakes. Um, so yeah, can everyone hear me okay? Is this a Good volume level. Um, okay, good. So yeah, I will jump right in. And again, I'm with the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, snakes are um, kind of one of my favorite groups of animals, very partial to reptiles and amphibians, but snakes and turtles are probably my, my top two. And I'm lucky to work with them both quite a bit. Um, so here in Maine, we have uh, nine snake species that are that are still here in the state. There formerly was a tenth species, the timber rattlesnake, and I'll talk a little bit about them as we go on. But that they've been extirpated from Maine, they've been gone for quite a long time at this point. Um, we still have nine species, and um, they represent um, several different lineages of snakes, and they are all pretty different from each other, really. And I'm gonna more or less go right through all nine snake species and take a little bit of a deep dive into, into how to tell them from other snakes, um, what parts of the state they might be found in, what their habitats are, um, what they look like, what they eat. Um, and we're definitely gonna have time for questions at the end. Um, 
and I'll just go right into it. So one thing that's always continually feels really exciting and cool to me about reptiles here in Maine and really all of our wildlife and our flora and fauna um, is not that long ago, Maine and the rest of New England and a lot of North America was covered by a mile of ice and there was nothing living here. There were definitely no snakes. There were no plants. There was just ice on the on the rocks and the gravel and the soil of what was there before. And so everything we have here came back and recolonized the the Northeast and Maine after the glaciers retreated. Um, and it, it partly explains kind of what species we have here. Um, biologists like to look at biogeography, which is kind of the study of of kind of why species are found where they are and how they got there. And um, I think the glaciated Northeast is kind of a, a classic thing that people study and, and look to see how animals got to be where they are. And, and you could look at um, reasons why they don't go further North, you know, for reptiles, for instance, it becomes too cold. Even in Northern Maine, it's the growing season, the, the warm summer season, so much shorter than it is in southern Maine that there ends up being very few reptiles that um, can can reproduce up there. Basically, the there's not enough warm days for their eggs to incubate and develop all the way for them to, to actually hatch reliably. Um, so you end up with very few reptiles up north. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to start off with the garter snake, which is um, probably the most familiar snake to anyone here in Maine. Um, they're pretty much found over the entirety of the state, one of the few reptiles that really does does live everywhere in Maine, um, maybe with the exception of really tall mountain peaks in some really small islands, but they're basically everywhere. Um, and um, garter snakes are, um, they're kind of a habitat generalist, meaning that they, um, they're not really picky about the places they live. You might have them in your backyard around old stone walls. They also like to be around edges of wetlands. Um, you could find them out in the forest. Um, really, really kind of all over the place. Um, like all other snakes in Maine and all other reptiles, because we are far north for, for reptiles, they do often prefer like edges of areas. So edges of field and forest, the back, the edge of your backyard in the forest, um, that kind of a habitat. Um, and so typically they might be about the size of what you see on the left here, um, but they can grow, grow quite large. That's about the biggest garter snake I've ever found. Um, we actually, I, we found that on a wood turtle survey and we nicknamed that snake garter conda uh, <laughs> because we thought that was funny at the time, uh, but that's just a a huge garter snake um, by anyone's standards, I think. Um, and very gentle, this snake did not bite or um, snakes will, one thing snakes do in addition to biting is they excrete musk, which if anyone's ever picked up a snake, there's a good chance you've had a snake musk on you. It's this really gross, yeah, I see some nods and some faces of disgust. It's a gross smelling, stinky, sticky, goo that comes out their cloaca and that's that's the name for what snakes have instead of a butt um i won't get into any more details but birds and snakes have cloacas um and that's where the musk comes out of and they do that to basically if you imagine imagine you're say a coyote and you come across a snake and you say oh that looks like a really tasty thing and i'm really hungry I'm just going to go ahead and bite that and start eating it. Um, you know, if you're a big coyote and the snake is a little garter snake like this, if suddenly your mouth is full of a really disgusting foul liquid, you might spit that snake out and then that snake might live, live to tell. <laughs> um, so at least for some predators, it works really well. There's some, there's some predators out there, like a lot of birds of prey that I think they just, they just say, I don't care. I, I just love eating snakes. They seem to eat them anyway, despite the musk. Um, so yeah, just some photos of a little different um, 
pattern of a garter snake. They're sometimes stripier, like like the one on the right, and then other times they the stripe is much fainter, and they can kind of have this olive dorsal color, and they even kind of have like a checker pattern. You can see a little bit on the snake on the left, especially when they're sometimes when they're agitated and they kind of puff themselves up to make themselves look bigger. It's a thing a lot of snakes do, not just garter snakes. Um, yeah, and really quick, this is, um, we have a statewide um, citizen science project called the Maine Amphibian and Reptile Atlas Project that has been running since the mid 1980s and keeps track of what towns and townships um, around the state have what species of reptiles and amphibians. So this is this is what that data looks like here. And you can see garter snakes are pretty much everywhere. They're about as everywhere as any reptile. Anywhere where you see a white square means we don't have a garter snake recorded, but it probably doesn't mean they're absent. It just means no one has gone there and found one. And it tends to mostly be the towns that are really far away from where anyone lives. <laughs> um, so yeah, moving on, uh, the milk snake. It's a really beautiful snake we have here. Um, one of our larger snakes, often about three feet long, um, two, three feet long, sometimes maybe not quite four feet. Um, they have this really pretty blotched pattern um, and it can range from being kind of like a chestnut brown to maybe a little more dark brown and against a kind of light brown or gray background. And, um, they have a, a kind of red to chestnut brown eye. And you can see a little bit on the photo on the right. It's not great because it's out of focus, but they have this really cool pattern on their belly. It's like a, a checker pattern. Um, it's pretty distinct. Um, and so milk snakes are um, in the genus Lampropeltis, which also includes king snakes, if folks have heard of them. We don't have king snakes here in Maine, but um, milk snakes are basically a type of king snake. Uh, and they're famous because they like to eat other snakes. So milk snakes eat other snakes. They also eat mice and amphibians, um, but they're related to these snakes that are really fond of eating other snakes, um, say in the Southeastern US and in the West. And, the, and king snakes will eat rattlesnakes regularly and other venomous snakes, and they're pretty resistant to the venom. Um, so a couple more photos of a milk snake. Um, on the right there is a hatchling. And so they have this really bright red blotch color against a kind of creamy gray background. Um, and a lot of times folks will find those and think that it's some exotic or non-native snake because it looks kind of like a tropical snake. And so every single fall when these start to hatch, I'll get emails, I'll get phone calls. People have a milk snake. They often show up in, in houses and barns and basements. They really like old stone foundations and they'll they'll even spend the winter inside the foundations of many old houses here in Maine. People find them every single winter. <laughs> um, and so people find these and think they found something that might not belong here um, pretty often. Um, yeah, milk snakes are, they're not found statewide. They're kind of Southern central Maine. Um, they do get out as far as just barely into Washington County up to cherry fields, the furthest east we have milk snakes recorded. Um, the next snake here is the northern water snake. Um, these are, no big surprise, a snake that really spends most or all of its time in and around water. Um, these are snakes that prey on fish and amphibians. Um, they really hardly ever go far from water. Um, occasionally, you'll one will turn up in a strange place, not near any seeming habitat, but um, mostly they're in places where, yeah, there's abundant frogs, tadpoles, fish, things like that, that they can feed on. They have this uh, banded pattern um, that's really kind of bright and vibrant when they're young. And as they get older, it basically just starts to turn to black or almost black, except for their belly. You can see their belly is this white and uh, kind of dark red, these sort of like half moon red shapes on it. Um, yeah, and if you've if you've picked up a garter snake and smelled the the sticky musk of a garter snake, it's it's nothing compared to what these guys can deliver. They're they they they're bigger snakes. <laughs> they have a lot of musk. They also bite a lot. They're they're still harmless. So 
all all snakes ha that we have here in Maine are non-venomous and and harmless. Even if most of them would bite you, probably if you pick them up, it's just not going to have any um, other than kind of feeling bad. <laughs> and most of them, it's kind of they bite and let go. Some of them might hang on a little longer. Mostly the milk snake, <laughs> but um, but yeah, so they're a harmless snake. They're um, people see them around um, their camps and, and docks along the water a lot. Sometimes people mistake them for um, water moccasins, cottonmouths, which we don't have here in Maine. They don't make it any further than kind of the coastal plain of Virginia, it's the closest you'd find a cottonmouth to here. Um, but still, people seem to think that they could be cottonmouths despite that. Um, but yeah, they're kind of uh, southern Maine and central Maine, and then also a couple of di disjunct areas and um, disjunct basically means for, for anyone who doesn't know the word, it means separated out, out from the main area. So um, you know, they're mostly here, but there's this, there's this great big gap. And we've looked quite a bit. We're quite sure there's no water snake here. But then out here, kind of near um, Pallets and Moosehorn National Wildlife Refuge, we do have water snakes again. And then we recently confirmed there's an isolated population out in Blue Hill, which is kind of neat too. Um, so moving on, um, certainly one of Maine's most beautiful snakes is the smooth green snake. Um, they're, yeah, they're really these kind of grass green, emerald green, small snakes. Um, and then, yeah, this one's a good um, opportunity to talk about snake scales. So snakes typically either have smooth scales or peeled scales. So um, a peeled scale just means it has like a line down it and they typically look less shiny and, and look more dull. And they also feel a little different if you have one in your hands. Um, but this is a smooth scaled snake. Um, and about half of our snakes are smooth scaled and half of our snakes are keeled. Um, and yeah, they're this bright green. They have kind of a yellowish chin. Um, these are snakes that are mostly, that's a typical size adult green snake. They're really not, uh, not a big snake. They prey on insects primarily. Uh, they really like to eat grasshoppers. Um, they like kind of meadows, uh, often where it's like a little bit wet, um, where there's kind of interspersed patches of small low shrubs like blueberries and sphagnum moss. Um, they can be really abundant on um, in coastal areas, particularly on some islands. Um, so, you know, places like Islesboro is really well known for having lots of green snakes around um, versus if you're right on the mainland over in um, say Northport or Lincolnville, they're there, but they're not nearly as abundant. Um, and, and they're recorded from a lot of really small islands in Maine too that have maybe just one or two snake species on them. Um, so yeah, green snakes, they're, uh, one other cool thing about them is when they hatch, they're not bright green, they're like gray and not nearly as uh, vibrant looking. But within a year or so, they they turn bright green, um, and when they when they die, they turn blue. So every single year, we get reports of someone finding a blue snake, usually on the road, and people are like, "What is this?" And they start googling it, and the, the thing they usually come up with is the blue racer, which is a real kind of snake. We don't have them here in Maine. They're in the Upper Midwest in like Ontario, um, and they are kind of this blue colored snake. Um, but yeah, just kind of a an interesting thing. Basically, when they die, the 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 pigment in their skin starts to change, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, they lose the the yellow. There's yellow and blue pigment that makes green, and for whatever reason, the yellow pigment goes first, and you're left with the blue snake. Um, but yeah, distribution of the green snake. Um, most of the state, they're absent from the really high elevation Western Maine mountains, and they're and they're absent from um, most of Aroostook County. They just barely get into Southern Aroostook County, um, but they're pretty well distributed. All those gaps there kind of mostly represent just where people haven't found them, all those towns that are blank. Um, they're a little less conspicuous than say the garter snake. Um, more people run across. Um, so ring neck snakes are another another pretty and small snake. It's another smooth scaled snake. And this is a good photo. You can see they often have like an iridescence to their scales. I don't know if that comes through, but they're kind of like rainbow 
sheen on the scales. <clears throat> um, and they have, yeah, that characteristic ring on their neck, which could mostly help you not to confuse them with other snakes. So some people confuse them with another snake I'll show you in a minute. Um, yeah, they're a small, really secretive snake. They basically don't ever bask. Pretty much always find them underneath rocks or logs. Um, any place where there's like ledge, like a like a mountaintop, like um, you know, like here in the Camden Hills, up on the the bald tops of the hills, where there's blueberries and lichen and rocks sitting on top of other rocks, it's a great place to find a ringneck snake uh, and a green snake too, actually. But yeah, they really like that situation. Um, they eat a lot of salamanders, particularly redback salamanders, which are our most abundant and widespread amphibian here in Maine. Um, yeah, and they have this like really bright yellow to even orange uh, belly with rows of dots right down them. Yeah, and they're just a really, really cool, very soft and smooth little snake. And they, they never ever try to bite. So they're always, they're a good one, I always say, for if kids want to pick up a snake, this is a good, good one to start with. It won't bite you. They're small, they're docile. Um, <laughs> Yeah, then ringneck snakes, they have a maybe similar distribution to the last one, the green snake, um, really through much of the state, except for really high elevation Western Maine mountains and very northern Maine. We do get them as far up as Baxter State Park, which is right up uh, somewhere right around here. Some probably knows better than I. <laughs> um, but they get all the way up there. Um, next one, this is another beautiful snake. The ribbon snake, um, which is a real close relative of the garter snake. So they're in the same same genus. So they're cousins, essentially. Thamnophis is the genus. Uh, and they look a lot like a garter snake. People mix them up quite a bit. Um, garter snakes are really variable. Like I tried to show some photos. They can be have bold stripes, or they can have really kind of hard to discern stripes. They can be kind of black and white or more yellowy or more olive green versus the ribbon snake that pretty much always looks something like this. They have these really bold stripes. Um, another cool uh, marking on the ribbon snake, so maybe one other photo, in front of their eye, this scale right here is always white. So that's like a, a really cool way to tell them from a garter snake. Um, and yeah, similar size. They don't get quite as big as that giant garter snake I showed you, but this is a pretty typical ribbon snake. They're um, kind of aquatic to semi-aquatic. They really like it in and around wetlands, particularly like acidic wetlands, like um, bogs and fens, um, also large kind of marshes and vernal pool complexes. Um, they also prey on amphibians quite a bit. It's probably their, their primary prey. Um, yeah, got one more photo to show. You can really see that scale in front of the eye. Yeah, and they're, they're more slender than a garter snake on average. Um, they really do, do kind of look like a ribbon swimming, swimming or slithering through the grass. Um, and there's one more, there's a little newborn ribbon snake that I found up in a um, hazelnut bush one day. Um, mostly looks like the adults. Baby snakes, generally speaking, they're like a lot of baby animals. They have this like oversized head and big eyes. And they tend to look cute. If you think snakes can be cute, a baby ribbon snake's a pretty cute snake. Um, so yeah, ribbon snakes, These so this is a special concern species. So they're not endangered or threatened. Um, but they're a species that is sensitive to certain kinds of uh, habitat loss and is limited in the areas of the state it's found in. Mostly southern Maine, it gets up into kind of the Augusta area and a little south of there. Um, but there's a lot of the state where you don't find the snake. Um, it reaches the northeastern end of its range here in Maine. Um, and the next snake is the red belly snake, which is, I'd say, right up there with the garter snake in terms of being the kind of the most common snake. They're a little more, they're smaller, and they're a little more secretive than a garter snake. So um, 
if you're not looking for them, you're a lot less likely to run into one of these. But if you're someone out there who's flipping over logs and rocks, moving, say, wood piles and cleaning up your yard, working a garden, um, you'll eventually run into one of these if you haven't already. Um, and they're, they're a really cute little snake. Um, you can kind of see it. it's a pretty typical size red belly snake. Um, and they really have this bright red belly. And this is the one that sometimes folks confuse them with the ring neck snake. Um, you can see they have this kind of marking. It almost looks like a ring on their neck. And if you look at it right from above, it looks more kind of like a spot, which actually is where their name comes from. So Steraria is the genus, but occipito maculata, occipito means neck, and maculata means spot. So it's the neck spot Steraria. I don't remember what Steraria means, but that's the <clears throat> genus. And yeah, so from the side view here, you can kind of see that they've got this, it's not quite a ring, but, um, and with the ring neck snake, their color down their back is all consistently like a slate gray color. With these guys, it's, it's variable. This one's more kind of reddish brown with kind of rusty stripes. And then this one here is more of like a gray olive color with sort of rusty stripes. And this one on the right here is a little more tan, a different snake. Um, they're mostly statewide and they're really just absent from the really northern part of the state and up in the upper St. John Valley. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a, for anyone who hasn't spent time up there, it's still very much winter up there. They're not thinking it's going to be spring quite yet. It's, um, it's not a hospitable place for most reptiles. So there's very, very few reptiles up there. There's really garter snakes and wood turtle. Those are the only reptiles up in that far northwestern part of the state. Um, and um, so a close relative of the red belly snake is the brown snake. It's the same genus again, Steraria. Um, and they look quite similar. They have the um, same kind of pair of stripes down their back. Um, there's some key differences. Um, the brown snake does not have a red belly. So if you if you happen to pick one up, if you picked up a snake and you think it could be a red belly snake or a brown snake, the belly will give it away. Um, otherwise, they're they're almost always like this kind of light tan brown color um, versus the red belly snake can sort of be like this, but their their color of their dorsal or back surface is much more variable. Um, yeah, I don't have a Oh, I know I have one more photo with them. But and then so the, the brown snake also has these these kind of markings around its eye on the side of its face, which the red belly snake doesn't have. Um, but the belly is really the 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 really good one to start with. Um, and so these are mostly found in really southern Maine. Uh, they do get up close to here. I think I'm trying to remember which town that is. I think the Jefferson or Appleton. There, that dark town right here. Um, but mostly they come up to Augusta Gardner area and then down through that part of the mid coast to southern Maine. It's another snake that reaches its kind of northern end of its range here. Um, and one thing I always think is cool about this snake is they're really the only snake in the Northeast that can live in some pretty urbanized environments. Um, for instance, you could find them throughout a lot of like Boston and not just like the suburbs on the outskirts of Boston, but actually like in the city, if there's little scraps of something kind of close to nature remaining, these snakes can often do pretty well in those areas. So um, it's it's interesting. Um, and they're, they're kind of the only reptile we have in Maine that, that would probably do okay in that kind of situation. Um, and this photo I, I kept in just because it's really nice to see in one hand, there's a brown snake on the bottom and a red belly snake on the top. So you can kind of see the difference. And that's a really kind of cool red brown, red belly snake, but the kind of classic color um, brown snake there, which they pretty much always look like that. Um, so timber rattlesnake is a snake that we historically had in Maine. And 
we have good evidence that we had them in at least a handful of places in the southwestern part of the state. Um, the last reliable reports of timber rattlesnakes were from the 1860s. So mm -hmm. it's been a really long time since we've seen them in the state. So we consider them to be extirpated, which um, is kind of a fancy word for extinct within a particular area. So there are lots of timber rattlesnakes in other states, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. They have lots of timber rattlesnakes. In New England, they're quite rare, and it's mostly due to deliberate persecution um, that began during kind of the colonial era and continues to this day to some degree. It's a little different now, um, but for, for a long time, many states and local governments and towns had bounties on timber rattlesnakes. And so there was real incentive to go out there and, and kill them. And because they're a long lived species that has to come back to the exact same den site year after year to get through the winter, once people kind of figure out where their dens are, they can just keep going back there at the right time of year. They're pretty, pretty easy targets. So they were extirpated from many, many sites, including all the sites we had in Maine. Um, and in New Hampshire, there's still one site where they're still found. Uh, Vermont has something like three. Massachusetts has about five. Um, Rhode Island, they're also extirpated. Um, Connecticut has maybe half a dozen sites. Um, you start to see more once you get up to New York State. Certainly, like I said, Pennsylvania, down into the southern Appalachians or more. Um, so kind of a sad one that, that we've lost them. Like a lot of people feel like excited that there are no venomous snakes in Maine. And I think it is nice that you don't have to worry about it, but it's also a big loss to kind of our natural heritage that we did have them here and we no longer do. And it was entirely because of, of deliberate killing by people. Um, so uh, with that, I'm gonna get a little bit into kind of a, a little more in depth on a rare snake we have here, um, the Northern Black Racer, which is our only state endangered snake. Um, these are the largest snakes we have in Maine. Um, they're a species that's habitat specialist that lives in dry upland habitats. So um, oftentimes like places with really sandy and gravelly soils and really just in southernmost Maine, almost totally in York County, a little bit in Oxford County. Um, and this is a hatchling racer. For their first year of life, they have this kind of bold pattern, and then they, they look like this once they're adults. So you can see they're quite big. Um, that's a typical size adult, um, one of our study animals um, down in Wells, Maine. Um, you can see down there, a uh, racer peeking out of the grass and blueberries. Um, they're a very fast visual snake. The name racer is just because they're a really fast snake. Um, so this shows you how limited their distribution is. There's about a dozen towns that we have them recorded from. Um, across those towns, about 30 sites. Um, so we've done quite a bit of work with this species. Um, one of the primary ways that we learn about them was, is with radio telemetry, which is putting radio transmitters inside the snake. So they go to a veterinarian who implants a radio inside the snake's body cavity. And then the radio sends out a little ping. We walk around with an antenna and we can tell which direction the snake is and go out and find that snake and see what kind of habitat it's using, where it's spending the winter, where they're laying their eggs. We can learn all kinds of things about them. So things we've learned is they have large home ranges. So the average home range of adult racers in one study we did was almost 200 acres. And they really like these kind of shrubland barren habitats. So it's think like a overgrown blueberry barren that has a lot of little saplings and shrubs mixed in with it. Um, but this is mostly parts of the state where it's because of the glaciers, it's just pure sand not really rocks and boulders like the blueberry barrens around here, um, but just these great big sand outwash plains from, from the glaciers. Um, and yeah, here's some photos of a little bit of what that habitat looks like. This is the Kennebunk Plains Wildlife Management Area. I really, if you're ever down in Kennebunk, a really beautiful place for, for 
birding, looking for racers, picking blueberries um, on the, the west side of Kennebunk, far away from the ocean um, towards Sanford. Um, there's a, another area at the same site that has undergone some habitat management, um, opening up the canopy and regenerating stump sprouts and shrubs. The racers really like this low, dense shrub cover. Um, they can be in the full sun, but they're not visible to pred aerial predators like hawks, which really like to get snakes. Um, and then other habitat is maybe not quite as natural, but provides a lot of the same kind of vegetation. Um, so big power line corridors in areas where sandy and gravel soils are great places for racers. And sometimes that's their primary habitat. And they're also using the forests on either side particularly following uh, timber harvest that open up the canopy and make it more of those kind of sunny and brushy conditions for a few years before the trees kind of grow back. Um, yeah, so we've done quite a bit of work in recent years uh, developing a population <laughs> monitoring program, uh, kind of working out uh, ways so that we can reliably go out and find the snakes and see how they're doing mark individuals so we can we can mark and recapture them so that's what allows us to estimate how many there are um and like i said we use radio transmitters to to look at their habitat use there's a veterinarian that works with us doing a surgery on the snakes the snakes are you know they're they're under with anesthesia during during the surgery it's a really fast operation it takes about 20 minutes and as soon as he's done suturing up the snake, they're taken out of the anesthesia tube and the snake wakes up. And we hold that snake for usually about 24 hours and then bring them back right where they came from. Um, and there's a that's a female racer, one of our radio snakes actually uh, digging her nest. So they find really loose sand and they, because they don't have any hands or feet, they use the only thing they've got, which is their head to dig into that sand and excavate a nest cavity and lay their eggs and then kind of smush the sand back in with their body and then they leave and they don't come back and the, the hatchlings um, hatch in the early fall in September or so. Um, so another, another photo, that's one of my field assistants with a racer, yeah, they're big, beautiful snake, really cool, really fast. Um, and they have these large home ra ranges and um, you know, quite limited in terms of where you actually find them. A lot of the habitat that they live in is, like I said, it's dry upland areas in Southern Maine. There's a lot of development down there. A lot of it's really primo places to build things because you have a big sandy, well-drained area of real estate. Um, it's it's not full of wetlands. There's not as many like complications with building something there. So one thing that happens a lot is solar development. And we've been studying solar a racer population in response to solar development uh, down at Sanford. Here we have one of our study snakes, right when we were releasing her with the newly installed solar arrays right behind her. Um, and so that's an ongoing study that we have been, we're now in the post-construction phase at this site, a large solar development was built and we've done one season of um, monitoring the snakes after the solar was put in and now we're about to start in another couple months here, our second and final post uh, construction season. Um, so with that, I just want to acknowledge some of the ways that we fund the work that we do with um, snakes and really all the non-game species here in Maine. Uh, so the loon license plate that everyone's familiar with is a, is a huge uh, source of funding for us. Uh, we often use that as a way to match money, money that we get from the US Fish and Wildlife Service through the Swade grants and sector fix grants there. And also the chickadee checkoff. If you're doing your taxes since it's tax season, um, that also goes to the same non-game and endangered wildlife fund that the loon plate contributes to. And those are really important uh, funding sources, particularly for reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates, and also also birds, like non-game birds. Um, and with that, I will uh, end here on this portrait of a racer. And if anyone wants to reach out, feel free to shoot me an email there and I will take any questions. Thank you so much.
Yeah. And throwing my wife around a bigger pond one day with a pond in the middle. And all of a sudden, she started screaming with the guard or something. I threw her in the lake, but the chance of the baby was Probably pretty good. So, yeah, it's funny, you know, more than once in recent years, folks have seen garter snakes out in Penobscot Bay, like between like Lincolnville and Islesboro, like way out there. And um, and no one really knows what they're doing, but it's it's not it's not just like someone saw it one time. It's like it keeps happening. Um, so I suspect some of them are probably making it somewhere. So in a in Pitcher Pond, the odds are pretty good unless like a bass came up and ate it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we wanted to uh, get involved with the uh, you know snake tracking that you were just playing on your maps. Yeah. Uh, how do we do that? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So yeah, if you um, I should have put a URL up here. So the project is called Mayrap, the Maine Amphibian and Reptile Atlas program, feel free to shoot me an email and I can send you a, a link right to it. But we have a page for it on IFNW's website and we have a data entry portal. And so you can just, you know, you can use it from a, with your phone or A great big green frog or or even a big bullfrog and when they yeah and it's not uncommon to find a snake with this huge bulge in its belly and it's sometimes such a big bulge that they're having a hard time getting around when they do that they are not going to eat for a little while <laughs> they're going to go sit somewhere where they can be really warm in the sun and get their metabolism going so they can digest um and that's just kind of like a you know strategy that snakes have they have this really kind of plastic jaw so they can eat really large diameter things they don't chew at all they are just swallowing things whole and then they they can swallow things that are really big and then they just have to deal with it and digest it for days or weeks on end um and in the like in the everglades there have been an invasive species mm -hmm. do we have any invasive species here yeah like the P burmese pythons yeah that no, we don't have any invasive snakes. Uh, we have one turtle species that's not native to Maine. They're they're here, but we don't know that we have any breeding populations. They're called red-eared sliders. They're really popular as pets, like all over the world, really. Um, and they can survive in Maine water bodies. Um, probably they can breed, though. Like I said, we don't have any evidence of that. Um, and yeah, we don't have any invasive snakes. We have one non-native amphibian, the mud puppy. Um, they're like a really these pretty cool eight, 10 inch long, fully aquatic salamanders. And they were introduced to uh, the Belgrade lakes. So they're kind of in that whole connected lake system, the Augusta area. Um, those are kind of our two. And, the, and those definitely are breeding and really well established and have even expanded since the, I think the 1930s is when they were introduced. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. They are, yep, yeah. They're definitely venomous. So we, like I said, we don't have them here in Maine, but certainly if you visit, yeah. Well, we used to have them in southern Maine, 
we don't anymore. Um, but if you visited another state where there were rattlesnakes, um, they're Oh yeah, well, <laughs> Australia's got all kinds of other venomous snakes, but not rattlesnakes somehow. But um, yeah, so so certainly like they're they're very venomous, and they use their venom partly to hunt their prey. So when a rattlesnake or another pit viper, which rattlesnakes are a type of pit viper, when they bite, say they bite a chipmunk that they're gonna eat, um, they they bite the chipmunk and they inject the venom through their fangs into the chipmunk. And the chipmunk basically falls asleep and then dies and the snake eats it. And so the prey doesn't put up a struggle versus a, a snake that's eating something that's still very much alive might get injured or bit by that, by that prey animal. Yeah. In Connecticut or in the Hartford area, we have copperheads. Yep. But none in Maine. None in Maine. Yeah. So they're in, yeah, they're right around the Hartford area, Connecticut River Valley. Um, and they're even in uh, eastern Massachusetts in the Blue Hills, just south of Boston, but none in Maine and none in New Hampshire. Um, yeah, they're Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont. Um, they have copperheads. But yeah, kind of like the rattlesnake. They're also persecuted. They often den in the same places. Um, yeah, they were, they're a little like maybe less conspicuous and were less persecuted. So they, fared a little better during that, that time than the rattlesnakes did. Um, but they're still quite rare in the, the places in New England where they are still found. Yeah. The king snake? Oh, well... Yeah. Oh, a, king, a, a brown snake in Australia. Yeah. So they're, yeah, they're in a elapid. So they're in the same family as coral snakes and cobras. And those are like the most dangerous snakes. Like their venom is generally a lot more, a lot stronger than, than the most of the venom snakes we have here in North America, not here in Maine, but in North America. So we mostly have vipers. We have some elapids like coral snakes which are the red and yellow and black banded snakes down in Florida and Texas and Arizona. They're a relative of the brown snake and of cobras. And so they have, their venoms are mostly neurotoxins. So the venom attacks the nervous system. And with uh, vipers, mostly not universally, it's like a hematoxin. So it's, it attacks blood and muscle tissues. And basically like if you get bit by a, a rattlesnake, the area where you're bit, the venom kind of starts to digest your tissue, um, which is not a good thing. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's certainly something most people who are bit by rattlesnakes live versus some of these snakes in Australia, which, like I said, they have much more potent venom. Um, you, it's much more dangerous to be bit by some of the snakes there. The most, some of the most dangerous snakes in the world are in Australia much much more dangerous than anything we have in the northeast we have some questions on zoom um has there been a consideration to reintroduce timber rattlesnakes yeah good good question um we haven't you know we haven't you know i personally have thought about it before and um we have there hasn't been any kind of formal department-led um efforts to try to do something like that Interestingly, Massachusetts, their state agency, Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game, they still have rattlesnakes, but they've lost them from a lot of sites. Five or six years ago, there was a proposal to, re to reintroduce them to an island in the Quabbin Reservoir, which is the big reservoir in Western Massachusetts that supplies drinking water for Boston. Um, and there was a huge amount of back backlash against it. And even though it's a completely closed off area to the public, it's an island in this reservoir for Boston and no one's allowed to go out there. A lot of people were really freaked out because they don't, because they're afraid really of rattlesnakes and were worried they'd be swimming to the shore and establishing colonies outside of the island. And it ultimately got totally quashed in the state legislature in Massachusetts. 
Um, so not saying that something like that would happen here in Maine if, if there was a, a move to do something, but yeah, at the current time, we, we don't have any plans to do that. Um, yeah. What would be the benefit of reducing that? Yeah, no, good question. I mean, part of it would be to restore a kind of key member of that ecosystem. Um, so, you know, if it was like, it would be a very local thing, right? So they were, to begin with, they were kind of almost barely here in Maine to start with, like they're edge of their range. They're just getting into Southwestern Maine near the border with New Hampshire. Um, so they weren't like a huge part of ecosystems. Like, you know, they're, they're a small to mid-sized predator. Eat a, they eat a lot of rodents. That's their primary prey item. Um, so in areas where you have healthy rattlesnake populations or healthy populations of any snake, they're having an impact on that ecosystem and they're controlling rodent populations. They're, you know, they're kind of playing that functional role. So that's one, one thing that would be a benefit. Um, yeah. The question on Zoom is, what can I do to encourage snakes to live in my garden? Hmm. Good question. Yeah, so... So snakes, especially here in Maine, like I said, they all pretty much want to have places where they can be in the sun and be warm. Um, snakes also really like to have um, places to hide because they're you know, mostly, even though they're all predators themselves, they're mostly pretty small compared to a lot of other things. Um, so, so even the black racers are picked off by red tail hawks, for instance. Um, they're not actually that big. They're long, but they don't weigh a whole lot. Um, so snakes like to have a lot of cover to hide in. So um, things like like rock piles and brush piles, um, anything you can do to kind of, especially on the edges. So if your garden is up against a forest or like a brushy area, um, the more you can do to kind of have those like um, more vegetation, like diversity and an edge and, and rock piles, especially like flat rocks stacked on each other, um, wood piles of rotting wood, you know, like, I mean, <laughs> one, one place where you often find snakes are places where there's a lot of junk lying around, but people aren't spending a lot of time there. So like old abandoned, you know, it's not like a, a beautiful garden setting by any means, but like say an old abandoned half falling down barn <laughs> at the edge of a field. It's a great place for snakes because they love those shingles and pieces of wood and it's brushy and wild and there's places to hide but it's also in the sun so you can kind of think about those kind of dimensions of things yeah they also love landscape fabric yeah oh yeah good point yeah landscape fabric any kind of like old like plastic sometimes that's left around not to encourage people to leave old plastic <laughs> lying around but um yeah, and one, actually one way that we survey for snakes is by putting out what we call ACOs or artificial cover objects, which is often like sometimes it's a piece of old corrugated metal or a piece of plywood. And so researchers will actually go out and, and like purposefully place these objects on the landscape, often give each one a number. And then you can go and do your survey. You go back through and be like, flipping overboard number one. One garter snake, two ring neck snakes, board number two, a mouse, board number three, milk snake. So like these cover objects really do attract snakes, particularly certain times of year. So like in the early spring, when the sun is strong, but the ground is still really cold, snakes can really warm up under those cover objects. And it's like, you know, in April and May, it's a great place to find snakes. But once it gets hot, like say in July, you're really unlikely to find snakes under those kinds of cover, cover objects, at least not not once in the sun. Yeah. What other states have an absence of venomous Yeah, good question. Well, definitely Alaska. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, hmm, not many. Um, well, Rhode Island now, because they they lost their timber rattlesnakes. Um, yeah, it might only be Maine, Rhode Island, in Alaska, uh, Hawaii, no venomous snakes in Hawaii. Yeah, there are no native snakes in Hawaii. There are no, there, yeah, there aren't really any established snakes. There might be this one little tiny snake that lives in like flower pots. 
it's kind of all over the world. Um, yeah, that might be it. Most a lot of places have rattlesnakes, and they, you know, there's even rattlesnakes in like parts of Canada, a couple of different species. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, probably just those states. Good question. <laughs> yeah. Now, are there any snakes that not eat chicken eggs? Yeah. Um, in Maine, I don't. In Maine, I don't think we have any. Um, other parts of the country, like so, rat snakes. Um, they even um, black rat snakes make it as far as like central and western Massachusetts. They don't get up to the northern New England states, um, but they're pretty famous for eating chicken eggs. And if you go on like YouTube or something, you can find videos of people finding them, and they're they'll go into chicken coops and they'll eat eggs and then they like can't get out the hole they got in. So people like think that's really hilarious. It kind of is. Yeah. And they'll, and they love to eat eggs. Um, and yeah, elsewhere in the world, there's, there's a lot of other snakes. There's even egg eating snakes, which are egg eating specialists in parts of East Africa. And they will swallow an egg and they have a special bone. I think it's actually part of their vertebrae and their throat. And so they kind of like get the egg into their throat and then like, crack it in their neck and then they like spit out the shell <laughs> and eat, eat the rest of it. Yeah. <laughs> Question on Zoom. What are your preliminary findings on solar farms and facts? Yeah. Research? Yeah. So preliminary findings, we've done, like I said, we've done one season after the construction and it was right when they finished building it and the, they were still even maybe finishing a few parts of it. This is a pretty large solar farm. That's one of the largest ones still to date in the state. We found we had a dozen racers that we were tracking, and only one of them ventured into the array areas just a couple times. So almost no use of these areas. The habitat was converted pretty dramatically. The reason why we're going back this year is because that construction was completed in 2020 or early 2021. It's now been a few years and the vegetation has, has grown. So we're expecting now that the vegetation has recuperated that we will see more use of the solar panel areas, but we still don't really know. We still don't think it will be as much use as in the surrounding areas that are that really dense shrub cover. Um, and part of it is to understand, so when when there is a development proposed in an area with an endangered species that has a certain kind of habitat and your development requires that you remove that habitat, you know, there's typically mitigation or some kind of way to either restore habitat just off the site, preserve habitat. And that's what happened in, in that case is there was habitat preserved just off the site and then also money set aside to pay be able to buy habitat in the surrounding area um, to kind of make up for the loss. But we we really want to, the reason why we're doing this is so that we can better understand. Um, a lot of the solar developers will argue that, well, this makes like open areas and um, kind of grassy habitats, and that's what's going to be here with the solar panels. And we might say like, yeah, like maybe, we really don't know because no one's really done this before. So we're really trying to see like, what you know how do the snakes actually react how do they actually after it's been there for, for a few years are the snakes avoiding those areas are they using them a little bit do they love them that's why we're going back yeah yeah um, why have a baby corn snake at home and i can't tell the difference between a milk snake and a corn snake oh yeah no i i hear you they look really similar um how do you know it's a corn snake? Did you get it from like a pet shop or? Okay, it's probably a corn snake. So they look really, really similar. Um, yeah, they're somewhat related. They're not super related. The corn snakes are more closely related to the rat snakes and the milk snakes are in the king snake genus. Um, but yeah, with a with a, a milk snake, they usually have this kind of Y shaped marking on the back of their head. I didn't really have a I didn't have a good photo of it. Yeah, maybe I can blast back to the milk snake. Um, so that's one way. Um, another way might be no, no good, no good picture. Um, yeah, 
the overall coloration on corn snakes is really variable. So like corn snakes from different parts of their range can be like, some are really bright, some are like really brown, like that milk snake there. Um, but yeah, but there's other, like, if you look really close, you can, if you've got a field guide out, you can look at some pictures that show like drawings of the scales on their heads, for instance, and the scale pattern on their face is gonna look really different. It's getting into the, um, you know, it gets a little, little tricky when you have really similar looking snakes like that. But good, good question. They're tricky to tell apart. Yeah. Apart from snakes, um, is there other species in Maine that the solar panels are affecting at all? Solar yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, so it kind of just depends on where the solar developments are sited. Um, so a lot of the species I work with are down in southern Maine. And so most of the, the sites I'm familiar with with solar are down that way. Um, but for instance, at the same site where we're studying the racers, there's also some rare grassland birds there, um, meadowlarks and upland sandpipers and uh, sa uh, savanna sparrows and um, yeah, a couple more even. So some of those birds can be like sensitive, like what they call area sensitive. So um, they need an open field of a certain number of acres in order to breed. And if and if you, it's still unknown to a degree, maybe a little better known than the snake situation, but if you, if you end up developing part of that field and shrinking it, it might go past the point that the birds would still tolerate it. And even though there's still some habitat left, it might just not be enough for that bird because it's a bird that really like needs to have these big open spaces. Um, so that's enough, that's one instance. I mean, some solar, a lot of solar sites get developed on totally forested sites where the forest is cleared to build the solar site. So for forest birds, it's not going to be their habitat anymore. It's going to be something else. Um, yeah. And, you know, mostly we're involved when it's species that are endangered or threatened and they're the ones we're keeping the closest eye on. And um, So are, are these birds going to be impacted by them now? Or? They are, yeah. Yeah, to some degree, yeah. Um, yeah, typically there'll be like a study will happen at the site to determine like what species are there. And um, oftentimes the the plans of where the panels will actually be laid out get moved around to avoid impacts to species. Um, it doesn't really ever stop the development from happening. It's a It's a process by which, you know, things are altered to like have less impact. And then if impacts can't be avoided entirely, there's usually there's some way to kind of make up for that. And it's, you know, it's it's an imperfect system for sure. But things like preserving habitat offsite, you know, for instance, at this this site down in Sanford where we're doing the racer study at the solar site, the the solar developer had to purchase a bunch of abutting property to the site that was really good habitat for racers that we had documented the snakes using. So we knew we knew that that was like worth protecting because it's one of the few places these snakes go. So it was a in some ways, you know, that's now permanently protected for the snakes. Um, but it was a little bit of a trade like. We're losing some habitat over here, but now over here it's permanently protected. Things like that often happen. Um, I have a question on Zoom. How? What is the best way to pick up a snake? Well, yeah, it depends. Um, they are fairly delicate, and you know, the smaller they are, the more delicate they are. But even large snakes, if you basically you need to support their body so that um, they don't injure themselves. That's kind of the biggest risk. So, you know, if you were to pick up a snake by its tail and it was a snake that was like fleeing you and really scared, it might really start to writhe and turn around and they can actually injure their spine in a moment like that. So you really want to kind of support their whole body. And if it's a 
if it's a small snake like this little milk snake, that's one hand, right? It's only this long. But if it's a larger snake, um, you may need to use two hands. Snakes like to kind of like wrap around you sometimes. Um, if a snake wants to move, a lot of times I'll do this thing where I'm I'm holding it with two hands and I kind of like keep moving my hands like this and let it kind of calmly and gently go from one hand to the next. Um, yeah, that's. So you could, some person said, I read that you should pick it up about a fourth to a third down its body. Is that true? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. And then like, you know, it's, it's a little different if you're, you know, if the snake's trying to bite you, <laughs> you can, you can get them behind their, behind their head, but it's a, it's kind of a delicate thing. Cause like I said, they are, especially the smaller they are, the more delicate they are. Um, so it's one of those things where it's like a firm yet very gentle grip. I, I do it all the time and I don't, you know, I don't really mind getting bit, but I usually don't want to get bit, especially by like a big racer. They pretty much always bite you, by the way, because they're just some snakes are bitier than others. Um, but they they bite really quick and then they let go. So it's and does the bite hurt? It's afterwards? like not really. I mean, it's it's like equivalent to like brushing into some like blackberries or something. It's like you get little pricks in your skin with little drops of blood, but that's about it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's mostly like if you're afraid of snakes and a snake bites you, it can be a traumatic experience. Um, and but if you're used, if you're not afraid of snakes and you're used to getting bit by snakes, it's pretty uneventful. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Good question. I would, I would maybe vote vote for the uh, the milk snake because. So they, something about when they bite you, they like don't always want to let go. <laughs> Almost all the other snakes will just bite and let go like that. But milk snakes will sometimes just like, they'll get on your finger and they're almost kind of like working on it and biting it. And like sometimes you're like, okay, come on, stop. And um, all you can really do is just like relax and wait for them to stop. <laughs> or, like, because if you tried to remove them, they're also like pretty delicate, like I said, and you could probably hurt the snake. Um, yeah, so I'd say they're the they've got the most ferocious bite. And the racers are bigger and and they're they're actually more likely to bite you, but they just they they bite you like that and then they let let go right away. But they actually also they're a little different than the other snakes because they they're a really visual snake and they'll actually try to bite your face. Which I don't really like. No one likes that, <laughs> even the snake biologist. <laughs> so whenever you pick up a racer and it's bitey, you have to like, you have to be like, "Hey, buddy, watch out! Don't get me in the eye." Yeah, that could really hurt. It could really hurt your eye. For sure. I would not want to get bit on the eye by any snake. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a good story, but a, a sad one. <laughs> I think we learned a lot. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.